Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Come and eat. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul... Turn to John, Gospel of John, chapter 4. Gospel of John, chapter 4. Yeshua is speaking to the woman at the well. And she's talking to him about religious things. Religiosity. And men's traditions being the way to the Father, the way to salvation. And he just totally blows her lid, the lid off of her cup or the, to her top. She said, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. You worship what you do not know. How many people worship what they do not know? They know traditions. They know religion. They know doctrines of men. This is their God box. This is their box called religion. But they don't know Him. You worship what you do not know. We know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Salvation is of the line of the tribe of Judah, Yeshua, the Jewish Messiah. Not the Jewish religion. It's not talking about the re Jewish religion here. He's talking about salvation was shown through Israel. And the Jews were the ones that remained faithful. And the Jewish Messiah, the one that the prophets prophesied about, would come to bring them to the Father, to bring them salvation. He was the one that was speaking to her. You worship what you do not know, for we know what we worship, for salvation is the Jews. But the hour is coming and now is. When the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Elohim is a spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and in truth. This is so loaded. We don't even understand the depths of what is being said here. I began to explore this passage. It rocked my boat back in 19, about 1995 or 1996. And since then I've been learning more and unpacking more and more. We can't go into all of it now. There isn't time. And most of us don't have the capacity. But we do the best that we can. Spirit and truth. Most of us spend our time in truth. But the Father is said that you must worship me in spirit and in truth. Truth is something that is perceived largely by the mind of man. It, it's a, it's a well, I, I shouldn't say that. Truth comes from the spirit. The spirit of Elohim and comes to our personal spirit. We are body, soul, and spirit. We are a tripartite being. Uh, Paul says that in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, and I can give you many other scriptures where it talks about the spirit in us, which is different than the soul. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. Okay, I'm not going to get into that. That's a whole other teaching. If you are at Sukkot this year, I may have I, that may be something I'm going to be teaching about, the spirit man, which most of, most of us have not been taught about these things, or very little. But it is the spirit in us that must connect to the Father, not our mind, will, and emotions. Too many times we come and we try to connect with the Father through our emotions. We throw our emotions at Him or we get all hyped up emotionally. I spent a number of years in the Pentecostal church and it was very blessed. But there's a lot of emotionalism there. It's not all emotionalism. And there's other, you know, in the, in the charismatic. But a lot of it, 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 the, the, it's very easy. It, we want the Father wants us to worship Him with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our heart and our emotions. But it's got to be under the control of the Spirit. And when the emotions are under the control of the Spirit, not under the control of the 
the soul man, it's a wonderful, beautiful thing, like the worship we saw here. But often, emotions can be ginned up and, and turned in and, and become huge so that the spirit is not in control. And that's a whole, well, maybe we'll talk about that later. Same thing with the mind. I grew up in a church where the mind, not it wasn't a Pentecostal or charismatic church, it was a church that was the opposite of that. We didn't believe in the Pentecost in, in Pentecost or the, we kept the Feast of Pentecost, but we didn't we didn't know what it was. We didn't believe in the, the gifts or the, the moving of spirit speaking in tongues or any of that. In fact we were scared of that and we were like, get that out of here. If you did you'd be kicked out. So in that church I we worshiped the mind. Everything was the mind. Everything was the mind. We would study the Bible. We knew the Greek and the Hebrew. We'd discuss and debate and argue about the words and all of this stuff. And we had all of this head knowledge. But we did not know how to hear the Father. We did not know how to be led by the Spirit. We did not hear the Spirit. So you can go to one extreme or to the other. But the Father says that He is a Spirit. And those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And that the things of Elohim are not perceived by the mind of man, by the soul of man, by the mind or the emotions or the will, but by the spirit. It says that in, I think it's 1 Corinthians 3, uh, it's somewhere in there. I don't have time to go through all that, we're just going over the waves. This is a very spontaneous, extemporaneous teaching here that ties in with a handout I want to give to you in a little bit. The Father is saying we need spirit and in truth. Spirit and truth. Too many of us, and I include myself, I am a Bible teacher. I have a lot of teachings out there. I've got like two Bible commentaries or Torah commentaries and uh, about 100 articles and two, over 2,000 um, blog pieces and 400 videos, most of which I have done. A lot of it is head knowledge. We need the, a foundation of truth, okay? And I get that. Those of us that are coming back to the Hebraic roots of our Christian faith, we need a, a solid foundation to build the house on. And it's got to be a foundation of truth. I mean, after all, if you don't know what the truth is, how do you know what to build on? So we need to know the truth. And Torah is truth. But then... But it's, that doesn't bring us in and of itself into a relationship with the Father. Relationship, look at the relationship that we have with uh, our children or with our spouse. It's not just based on the fact that you are my children. The knowledge that you came out of my body or we're married and we have a ring and a piece of paper and we exchange vows, that's great. But that's, he, that's, that's facts and head knowledge. You live in my house. We drove in the same car to get here today or whatever. But it's, it's more than that. It's about affection. It's about feelings. It's about spending time together. It's about communing together. It's about walking together. It's about friendship. It's about love. It's about sex. It's about you know intimacy. It's about all of these things. Sex can be just a, a, a function of a you know biological, emotional thing. And there may be no spirit or no, no heart in it. That's what prostitutes and people that go to them do. And that's what a lot of lust is all about. And there, there's a, a much higher level than all of that. See, all these things can be reduced down to just physical, mind, mechanical, biological, or even emotional. And the spirit is totally lacking. So the spirit has to do with a relationship. And it has to do with intimacy. It has to do with commitment and devotion and, and obedience. Okay. So we have to come to the Father in spirit and in truth. Not just on the basis of head knowledge. A lot of what happens when we, we, even of those of us in this group, and in the congregation before that, when we get together, and even when I would teach, a lot of it was head knowledge. Now I've always tried to um, put in spirit in true spirit in there, because I grew up with a lot of head knowledge and very little spirit in the church I was raised in before I got spirit filled. 
So I understand the pitfall or the ditch on that side of the road. And I also, also understand the ditch where it's just all spirit and all emotions and all that, and there's very little truth, and that's a ditch on the other side of the road, and I spent a few years in that ditch. There's a balance here. And when Yehovah began to reveal to me this scripture, 20, back, back in the mid-1990s, I realized I gotta, we've got to find the balance between spirit and truth. Now, I'm not going to give you my whole spirit and truth teaching, but largely speaking, the Jews... Okay, I'm speaking real generically here. The Jews are, are Jewish brothers who do not have Yeshua. They have the, live, the written Torah. They have a Torah scroll. And they walk around with it. And they, you know, they have all kinds of ceremonies and rituals that they do. And it's really important. And they, you know, they venerate it. They, they don't idolize it or worship it. Some people think they do. But, but they really don't. But in a sense... You know, they kind of do a little bit, but anyway, this is this is a little mini Torah scroll, which I carry with me, because I love the word of Elohim. I don't worship it, it's just, it's just a little paper one. But they are real focused on all the letter of the law, the do's and the don'ts, and in obedience, and in ritualism, and all of that. Now, the Christian church, so they venerate the, and, and, and have great love and adoration for the written word of Elohim. And of course, they've got a lot of men's traditions in there. All that, the Talmud and all that. We won't get into all those things. But that's where their focus is, is the jots and the tittles of the law. Now, the Christians, the Christian Christianity, churchianity, focuses more on the spirit of the law. On grace, on love, on loving your neighbor, and not so much on obedience after all, if we're under grace and Jesus did it for us, what do we have to do as long as we love our neighbor? And they just kind of like... It, they, so they focus on the living Torah and on the Spirit. So you have the one side that focuses on the letter and the truth and the written Torah and the other side on the Spirit and the living Torah, Yeshua, they call him Jesus, of course, and... The truth is in the middle. We need spirit and truth. We need the letter and the spirit. If you just have the letter by itself, Paul says the letter killeth, but the spirit maketh alive. Yes. If you just have the spirit, then it's what that, if all I have to do is the spirit of the law, then I can go back to the Sermon on the Mount and Yeshua said, you know, you shall not, Look at a woman in lust or not have hate in your heart. That's murder. So if I'm just going to follow the spirit of the law, it's all right to have physical sex with somebody who's not my wife as long as I don't um, lust after her. Or it's all right to murder somebody physically as long as I don't hate them. Of course, that's absurd and that's ludicrous, but that's basically what the Christian church teaches. Now, on the other side, the Jews teach, if you just have the letter of the law, I'm not saying the Jews teach it, but if you just have the letter of the law, then it's all right to hate as long as you don't murder. It's all right to not lust as long as you um, don't commit adultery. And that's what Yeshua was addressing at the Sermon on the Mount. He was talking to the Jewish people in that day where they had the letter, but they were missing the spirit. Well, the, a lot of our brothers and sisters, a lot of the time in, in the church, a lot of us in the past, we've missed the letter. Well, we can rest in the Lord and we rest every seven, you know, we rest all the time, but I don't have to keep the Sabbath. See? That's the spirit, but not the letter with regard to the Sabbath. The Father wants us to do the Spirit and the letter. That's what the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is all about. Okay, we could spend hours talking about that alone. Back to Spirit and Truth. Spirit and Truth. Now, most of us come out of the, almost all of us, one way or the other, come out of the, you know, the, the mainstream Christian church. Oh, let me just say, Within Christianity, you have also this spirit and truth paradigm. You have denominations that focus more on obedience 
and holiness and the do's and the don'ts and on rituals and then you have denominations that focus more on the spirit. So you have on one side you have maybe some of the mainstream, the, I mean the, the mainline denominations, some of the orthodox type religious organizations or denominations, Roman Catholic and Lutheran and Episcopalian and 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 Methodist and some of those, and then you a little bit over more to the middle you have the Baptist and you know non-spirit-filled evangelical that you know don't really get into the spirit too much as far as the gifts and the and and the power of the spirit but th they believe in it but they're they're you know they're not so much into ritualism and then you have the pentecostals and the charismatics on the other side they're really you know and again each denomination is different i've been in a number of them and, and experienced quite a few so i kind of have a sense of that so you have kind of a range there too well, we want the truth that they all have and the spirit that they all have that lines up with the Bible. So I'm not dissing anybody in particular. I'm saying there's a lot of that's out of balance there, and we want to get back to the Bible. And look, none of us have arrived. I haven't. But we're learning and growing, and we have to identify the issues and the tendencies of human beings to go to one extreme or to the other or someplace in the middle without finding the perfect balance between spirit and truth that Yeshua is talking about here. Okay? So, anyway, we see the spirit and truth paradigm also between the Tanakh and the testimony of Yeshua. The Tanakh, the Old Testament, focuses more on the Old Covenant, quote-unquote Old Covenant, and the Torah and the letter law, whereas the New Testament focuses on the, the, the grace, the mercy, I'm not saying the New Old Testament doesn't teach those things. It does. But the New Testament definitely, definitely focuses more on the spirit of things. So some people that are only spend their time in the New Testament will gravitate more in that direction. And those that are only in the Old Testament or the Tanakh will gravitate more in that direction. Again, we need the whole thing. Genesis to Revelation, the spirit and truth, the Old and the New Testament. Okay, We see that it play between the prophets and the Torah. Or maybe we say the Torah and the writings and the prophets. The Torah, the Torah is more the truth, that's the foundation, and the prophets and the, um, the writings. The writings would be Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Ruth, and these, these guys, Job. Those would be more the spirit of things. We see this, this dichotomy. It's not a dichotomy. It's, it's really two sides of the, of the same coin. Um, this paradigm or this, this two-sided indivisible situation in many it manifests itself in many ways. I'm hoping I'm giving you kind of a, a view of this. Now, those of us getting back to what I just was saying, those most of us come out of a, a mainstream Christian kind of a background, okay? And we maybe were a little bit starved for truth. We had a little bit more of the spirit, not so much the letter. So we have come back and we've studied the truth that maybe we were deprived of, and and the and and the Torah and all of that, and we some of us have found some of the answers in studying what the Jewish sages have written and and been blessed and so and so on. And some people go clear to the other extreme and get all get, get all caught up in that, and and that's that's a whole other extreme. But as a as a people, many of us have veered more toward the truth side, and we want to talk about the truth and not so much about the spirit. And that's because we've been hungry for that and starved, and we want to make sure we have a solid foundation. Well, most of you have a pretty solid foundation in these things. And, and once we have that foundation, and even in our congregation, we, when we first started almost 20, about 20 years ago, uh, we gravitated more toward the Spirit, and then, or toward the truth, and the Torah, and then as time went on, we began to emphasize more, not just doing Torah studies and reading the Torah, but we need to get more into the New Testament and the Gospel. And, and we, we found ourselves, and I as the pastor of it, moved, trying to find that right balance. So now, this is, this is now we have this home fellowship, and this is what I try to put out as the best I can, answer questions and so forth. So, what is the point of all of this? The point is, many of us are still 
focusing a lot on the head knowledge and the truth, and we're missing the law of the spirit. And we need to focus on the the the, the transforming power of the relationship that only comes spirit to spirit with our Father. Okay? Now, you can have be transformed in your lifestyle as you come up against and encounter the truth of the Torah and the rest of the Bible. And you'll maybe you'll start keeping the Sabbath and the biblical feasts and turn away from the traditions of men which have made of none effect the Word of God that there are many in the religious denominations and churches that we've come out of, and, and we begin to walk more lined up with the truth, and this is very good. But many people are still empty and do not find that once they get their head full of head knowledge, they still have leanness of soul. They're still missing something. It's because... They got all this head knowledge. I know because I grew up in this, and I was thirsty for more of Yeshua. I grew up in the head knowledge for the first 30 years of my life, and I cried out for Yeshua. Yeshua, where are you? I want you, and I was desperate. And I had to go searching for that outside of where I was at, and that's when I got filled with the Spirit in my living room one day. He was merciful and gracious to me, and that started a whole new journey for me which has been going on now for almost 30 years. So, what I want to give people, I can give you the head knowledge, and you can get it out there, just go on the internet. But we need the spirit. We need to know how to walk out that head knowledge in a way where we are a river of life to those around us, where we are helping to expand the kingdom. We're not just a a funnel that all goes in here and we have all this head knowledge so our heads become this big but we have to share what we have that's why a few weeks ago I taught about the Romans 12 motivational gifts it's not just so that we can know what our gift is and say look at me I'm a teacher I'm a prophet I'm a you know an administrator or a leader or I'm a whatever a servant or a, or a helper or a exhorter you know, no, it's so that we can know what we are, so we can be a blessing to those around us. And when we step in that river of life, guess what? We find the joy and the fulfillment and the mission and the destiny for which we were called. That's why it's very important that we get together to encourage one another, like we're doing here today. That people get together because otherwise you sit at home and you sit on the internet and you read and you watch videos and you learn and you read your Bible and that's great, but you don't have a way to encourage one another and maybe we're out in the world blessing others, maybe we're not. Hallelujah that, that she's got a heart for the Koreans and she's you know going to be a river of life to them and they're going to Japan and, 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 and try to help that dark nation. Some of you have outreaches and you're doing that. We need to just be a walking outreach everywhere we go. And to be a river of life means we've got to be in the river of life. And our spirit, man, needs to be connected to the spirit with a capital S, which is how Elohim feeds us. And then that feeds our mind, will, and emotions and directs us what to do. Having said that, could I get somebody, one of the, one of the young men over here, to pass one of these out to everybody here? I got plenty for everybody. And this is a panned out. I put this on my blog. This is 22 practical tips to walking in the presence of Elohim. To be, this is one of my sayings. I have sayings that I coined. Remember this. To be a river of life, you have to be in the river of life. If you're going to learn how to swim in a river, you've got to get in the river and start swimming. You're not going to learn to swim if you're on the sidelines looking at the river. So, just like Ezekiel, he, there, there was a river that flowed from the temple, the vision he had of the temple. And he went, he got in the river, and Elohim said, get deeper, get deeper. And finally he was like swimming, he was in over his head. And we sometimes need to get in over our head. And I have taught this in so many ways, 
I have taught what I'm teaching here in so many ways. And I pray, I pray, look, I, I, that people are getting it. I want to see revival. You know what my greatest desire is in this life? Is to see revival, genuine revival, and I want to be one of the people that helps bring it in. I don't want to be the head of it. I don't want to be the head of anything. I want to be a servant, helping to help the spark, to fuel the flames, to be a spark so that it takes off, so that he gets the, he gets the, the glory. I don't want to be the head of it. I don't even want to be a leader in it. Because there's grief that comes. There's headaches. There's persecution. There's attacks. I don't mind attacks. I've been getting it all my life. But I don't mind a little bit. I'll, I'll be a leader, but I'll be a little leader. I don't want to be a big leader. But I think we all should want to be leaders, to lead other people to Yeshua. Hallelujah. So here's 22 practical tips. Look, I believe that if we, we can have a religion and we can have a Bible, but if, if all it is is a head trip and we go to church or we go here, we go there, and it's all in our head and we're not walking it out in a practical way, what is the purpose? It is a drug that we go and get our fix like a drug addict and we get our religious fix every week I see people going down to the Catholic Church at my at the end of my street and the cars after them and I'm not judging anybody look there's really good people but but there there's it's I can't you can't even get out of your driveway out of your road because it's hundreds of cars one after the other and they go and do their do their thing. And I hope and pray that their hearts are right, but I know statistically that most of them are going through a religious ritual and it's, it's not doing anything for them and it's not translating into their lives. And I know that with most churches. Statistically, go, go read the statistics that come out of the Barner Research Group. Okay, this has been well known for years. And the Pew, the Pew um, uh, Research Group, no, we need to be involved in religion that transforms our hearts, circumcises our hearts, changes our lips, our mouths, what we speak, changes how we think. Only then can we then be a light and salt to the world. Only then, when there's revival in ourselves, in our own hearts, only then can we help to revive other people. We can't Expect other people to walk out, but we're not walking out ourselves. It will ring hollow. It will be a clanging gong and a, 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 and a, and a tinkling cymbal. It will be nothing. So, you all have this handout. You can take it with you. I'm going to read what I've written here. It's time to extricate Yehovah Elohim from our religious boxes to which we have confined him. These boxes are the times and places where we go and do our God thing. This can be a church or other religious service, grace at meals, and even our personal devotional times. After having thrown a bit of religious ritualism at Elohim, too often we toss our hair back, adroitly slip him onto the back burner, and then go our way as if he weren't much of a part of our lives. In this way, we keep Elohim confined to a few small boxes that we have labeled religion. It ends up that we live our lives how we want to without thinking too, having to think too much about Him. In this way, we keep Him trapped in these closet prisons of our own contrivances when, in reality, He wants and demands to be part of every aspect of our lives. Too many of us... Too many of us have no problem with Elohim being our Savior, but being the Lord and the Master over every area of our lives all the time? Well, that's another thing. To experience the blessings and riches of Elohim's river of life, each of us must immerse ourselves in this river and stay in it continually. And the following tips Okay, the following tips will help you to do that, and I'm sure there's many others that could be added. If you have any suggestions, I'm, I'm open. It doesn't 22. There's nothing 
special about the number 22. That's how many I could come up with, and that's what I ended up with. So these are some practical tips, and I would encourage everybody to read them. I have these tips on my blog. I've published it, and maybe I'll put a link on this video to that. Uh, anyway, here are 22 practical tips for bringing Yovah into every aspect of your daily life. Number one, in all things be thankful to Yovah. And I give the scriptures for all of these. Throughout the day, be aware of all your blessings and thank Yovah for them. Even thank Him for the trials. Yes. Even when you're around other people, even ungodly people, you don't even know what their spiritual orientation is. Let the river flow. Be th thank Him. You may have an atheist or, a, or an agnostic or somebody that's with you. Just You don't have to preach at them. Just, just in the middle of the conversation, thank you, Lord, for this whatever. Just I do that. Just pray in the middle of it all. Yes. You ever run into people like that? Just give them thanks in the middle of the conversation. It takes a little bit of boldness, but you'll get used to it. <laughs> pray in the Spirit in your heavenly prayer language. I, I pray in the Spirit almost every day, sometimes many times every day. I, I don't know what to pray. I'll just start praying in tongues. It's just, it's just a way of life for me. And then nice, you, don't, you don't have to think about what you're praying. You can just pray in the Spirit. Meditate on a Bible verse. This is a good thing. Find a Bible verse that you can, when you're driving to work or whatever, or driving to the store, you can be meditating on it. Sometimes you can put them on your on little card, sticky tabs, attach it to the dashboard or your steering wheel of your car. Prayerful, prayerfully intercede for people during the course of the day as they come to your mind. I once was in a church where the pastor, <coughs> Pastor Bill, he goes, if somebody comes to your mind during the course of the day, pray for that person. That may be the Spirit of Elohim prompting you at that moment to pray for them. Sometimes I think about people I haven't thought about for decades. So I'll try to remember to pray for them at that moment in time. I won't even know how they're doing, so I'll just pray a generic prayer. And if I don't know how to pray, I'll pray in the Spirit. I figure the Ruach knows how to, you know, what their need is. This is how we stay in tune with the Spirit, in tune with Elohim. How we connect our spirit to His Spirit and be continually filled and edified. Ask you of all questions and wait for Him to bring you the answer. He may download the answer into your mind, or it may come through someone else or in some other way. Ask Him questions. Maybe about a Bible verse, or a question you have about life, or, uh, or something you're not sure about, which direction He wants you to go in. Just pray and leave the answer at the altar. And then as you're going about, you'd be surprised how many times the answers come. It might happen as you're driving in your car. It might happen as you're in the shower. Or it might happen, you know, you relax, you're falling asleep. Or maybe you're doing something. All of a sudden, boom, there's the answer. How many of you have had that happen to you? And then write it down so you don't forget it. Keep a journal. Pray for divine appointments each day and then wait for them to come and give you of all thanks when they come. A divine appointment is a chance meeting of someone with whom you can share the word of Elohim or in some way be a spiritual light to them by pointing them to Elohim. Or maybe it's somebody you can pray with or somebody that has a prayer need. Very few people, very few people that I have encountered that have a, a need, they're sick or they don't feel good. Can I pray for you? Very few people say no. There's your opportunity to meet somebody at their point of need and sow a seed. Don't use that as an opportunity to preach at them, because that comes across as kind of hollow and, and patronistic. And it's like, you know, have agendas. But, but go ahead and sow the word and bless them. And you can get a little, sow a few seeds, just don't get real preachy, because that could be a, you know, that might turn them the wrong way. But just be led of the Spirit. Maybe, maybe you can get preachy. You know? Who knows? Depends. Um, pray, worship and praise you of all through the day by singing songs to Him. You know, we some of these really simple songs that we sing are really good. You know, some of these songs have really complex verses. It's hard to remember them. But I'm constantly singing to Him during the course of the day these simple songs that we've learned. That, you know, that around that you play with a guitar around the campfire. I remember those. I can remember the words. 
And I'm constant. I like music. I sing, but I, I'm constantly singing, especially when I'm happy and I'm just worshiping and praising Him through song. Music is wonderful because it helps us to remember the words of the music. It's hard to remember to memorize scripture verses, but when we commit it to memory through music, just like creating me a clean heart. We all know the words of that song. You can sing that. I sing that song quite frequently. That's from Psalm 51. Pray before and after meals, or even after taking a drink of water. Before the meal, praise and worship you of all. After the meal, thank Him for the meal you've just had. How many times of us, how many times do we go through life and eat our meals and we don't thank Him for it or, pray, or praise Him for it afterwards? Or praise Him before and thank Him afterwards? How many times do we do that? That's a Torah command. That's following what Yeshua did. I may not always thank Him at that moment, but I try to do it afterwards or sometimes I, I forget, I'm in a hurry, and I'll thank Him later. But I always try to thank Him, even when I take a drink of water. I don't do it every time, but I try. Look, it's a blessing. Mm -hmm. You know, our Jewish brothers and sisters even have a prayer of thanksgiving after you've relieved yourself in the bathroom. <laughs> yes, there's a prayer for it. You have seven holes in your body, the prayer goes. Thank you, Lord, for the seven holes. And the prayer goes, if any one of those holes were to get plugged up, I would die. Yes. Think about it. How many of us take these things for granted? Every breath that we have is a gift. This is how we can stay connected to Him. In this country, we are so wealthy and we are so blessed and we have medical care and we have this and we have that. We take so much for granted. I was listening just the other day to a missionary who's been to Africa many times and he goes, you know, there's like a Nigeria. The northern half of Nigeria is basically Muslim. Now, Nigeria used to be pretty much a Christian nation. It was, it was colonized by the British and heavily evangelized. But the Muslims have been moving in and killing and persecuting the Christians and burning whole villages and with machetes and axes, killing thousands, hundreds of Christians. And the Christians don't Fight back. Not much. That's a whole other discussion. But this missionary was there a few years ago, and he went, and this has been happening in Syria also, uh, by Christians, where whole, um, peop whole villages are destroyed, and the women and the children are taken into slavery, and many people are killed. And you go there, and the people are rejoicing They've just lost their loved ones and they're rejoicing. Why? Because Jesus is all they have. And when this missionary went to Nigeria, he said, why are you rejoicing that our loved ones were worthy to be counted, to be persecuted for Yeshua? Oh. Guys, I don't know about you, but I have not experienced that. And this does not compute with my brain. I know what the Bible says, but I have not experienced this kind of joy. That's all they have is Yeshua. Gee, they call him Jesus and the Bible. That's all they have. They live in huts. And when your hut is destroyed and your crops are destroyed and your family is taken away, all you have is Yeshua and he is your life and your joy. And so let's rejoice because they know that their loved ones are in awaiting you know, the resurrection and are in a better place. Boy, we can learn from our, our persecuted brothers and sisters. And I'm sure some of you that were born in Russia, the former Soviet Union, could tell stories like that. And some of you that were born in Korea, you know, and other countries where there was persecution for your faith during times of war and so forth, you probably could tell stories from your parents and grandparents who were Christians. I'm seeing heads nodding right now. Okay. Next point. View yourself as an ambassador for the kingdom of Elohim in everything you do and say that involves others. Endeavor to be salt and light to those around you for the glory of Elohim. Too often we get so caught up in our own lives, so caught up in our own work, so caught up in our own 
personal health issues, emotional issues, needs and wants, that we don't think much beyond anybody ourselves. And if we do, it's usually head knowledge and we're doing the work of the Lord or we're doing this or we're doing that. And we're not thinking too much about being salt and light to those around us. I just encourage you, let's all think about that a little more and ask for Yah to give us situational awareness. There's a word. Situational awareness of the spiritual needs of others and how can we bless them. And I, you know, I'm preaching to myself. I fall down big time in these areas. I really do. I, I have to preach this to myself just to keep myself reminded of these things because it's so easy to get caught up in the busyness of life and forget to do these things. Practice the six, 16 attributes of Yehovah's love as found in 1 Corinthians 13. All the, your know, love is this, love is this, love is this. Especially find, when you find yourself in a difficult situation where being loved, being loving is hard to do. I have to tell myself all this all the time to keep my carnal nature in check and it still gets out and says, thing and act, says things and acts in ways that it shouldn't. And if I just go back to 1 Corinthians 13, you know, <clears throat> and try to do that, I'd be much better and, and, th and life would be better for those around me. Live each moment and day as if it were your last. If you knew you were going to die tomorrow, what would you do differently today for the kingdom? We don't know what our next breath is. We're all a breath and a heartbeat away from death. Every one of us. I was up a week ago. A week ago last night, I was up at OHSU ministering to a woman on her deathbed that you don't know, and I never even met her. But I got a call from the pastor down in Salem, and he said, I can't make it. This lady said she went to my congregation, but I don't know her. Can you go up there? And there she is, coma. Had a big heart attack in early February. She lived was from south of Salem. They took her in. They did a surgery. It's not going the way. She's only 70. I saw pictures. Her kids were up there. I saw pictures of her. Back a couple months ago, she was out hiking with her great, great her grandkids, and she's got great grandkids. She looked healthy. She looked, and there she's laying. In, I walked in the room, and her eyes popped open, and like there was a recognition, but I could not make contact with her. But I was speaking to her spirit, and I ministered to her for I don't know two and a half hours or so, off and on. As the she was in intensive care, there were nurses and people coming in and out. We did what we could. You never know. She had a heart attack. And when I walked up there, I never met any of these people. I just went as a, you know, just because I got called and there was nobody else to go, so I went up there. And the, the, when I walked in there, the kids were leaving the room to go meet with the doctor to talk about taking her off of the, the machines because they're, they're, they said there's no hope. She's not responding, and she's not. she got life flighted up here a week and a half ago, and, and she's just barely breathing on her own. She's on a ventilator, and on and on it goes. And they all came back in about an hour later, all crying. They got to let mom go. You just never know. That could be any one of us. So live each day as if we were your last. I talked to a man. That job we did out in Canby where we took all those trees down. That I don't know how old that man is. He's in his 70s. But two months ago, three months ago, his wife died. She was fine. She got an aneurysm and boom, gone. She lingered for several weeks and then she was gone. And then, and then he's got property, and his kids, a couple of his kids live on the property. They've split, they've got acres, they've split, and they've all built their homes. And the, pro, the house just below us, it was on the other side of the driveway. That, that gal, he was 40, no, he was like in his 51 or late 40s, and her husband, the son-in-law of the man, just dropped dead. Uh, can, oh, cancer, didn't just, he got cancer. And he was like, Younger than me. You never know. So they lost two family members in, in a period of about three months. He lost his wife and, and his daughter lost her husband. Um, live each moment and days if it were your last. Express joy in the face of adversity. Endeavor to plant spiritual seeds wherever you go. 
I'm always looking for opportunities to plant spiritual seeds. I'm passing out Bible tracts and, and um, um, what do you call it? Bread of, uh, daily breads to everybody, all my customers. Almost every single one gets a tract and a, a my tract I've made and a daily and a and a daily bread. When they give me the check, I give them one of these. I've been doing that for years. It's one one way to witness to them. I mean, there's different things we can do. Some of you guys on social media, you know, your social media titans. Well, use it. Don't just spend your time chit chatting about silly stuff. Use it as a way to to bless people. When bad things happen, you count your blessings. Express joy, be thankful, bless your enemies, pray for those who despitefully use you. Always practice the golden rule. You all know what the golden rule is. Do it. It makes a difference. Practice being a peacemaker, especially in difficult situations when you want to defend yourself or fight back. Just zip it and be a peacemaker. You don't always have to get the last word. Do something selfless or altruistic for someone each day. Do something for somebody that can't pay you back. A homeless person or somebody that you can't, I mean, whoever that might be. They, they no, they can't pay you back. It's more valuable spiritually if it costs you something and no one knows you did it. Do everything including the most meaning, menial, minimal and menial task for Jehovah's glory. And out of love for him, work as if you were working for Yehovah and not for men. I tell my customers, they thank me for a good job I did. I said, I'm working for him. They've had other contractors come on their property and leave a mess and this and that. I go, look, and they thank me. I said, look, I, I love you, but I'm working for him. Uh, he's my boss, and I won't please him. And I figure if I can please him, I'm going to please you. <laughs> They get a smile on their face. Yes. Read your Bible and pray after you get up in the morning and, it, and as you're going to sleep each night, even if it's only for a few minutes. Everybody's too busy. Baloney. You're too lazy. And you have too many idols in your life. You're not too busy. It's time to get rid of the idols. Even if it's just a few minutes. Start the day out. Just, you know, give him, not the crumbs, but give him the best part of the day. And then as you're falling asleep, start the day out and put those good thoughts. I keep a Bible by my bedside. I, I, I don't always read it, but I do quite frequently. And, I'm, and, and um, I usually pray, um, either in my office or as I'm falling asleep. And I'm often listening to godly music. I listen to praise music as I'm falling asleep. Almost do one of those things every night. Put the audio, bi audio Bible on your iPod, smartphone, or similar electronic device and listen to it during your day. Wear biblical ZCs or fringes on the four corners of your garments. I wear, okay, I wear them almost all the time. I just, I, I, I wear them to work, but I need to sew, make a new pair because I wear them out really fast. But I, most people don't even wear fringes. I don't even know how many people are here wearing fringes. It's a commandment, guys. And I'm not going to judge you if you do or don't, but I try to practice what I preach. It is a biblical commandment, and it is, just like this wedding ring is a, um, you know, testifies to people that I'm married and I'm, and I'm taken. Well, your zitzis testify, you are taken, you are under covenant, you, you are in allegiance to the Elohim of Israel. We say we're Hebraic, well, then act like it. Um, let's see. Fast periodically, even if it's only for a meal or two. Um, many, among the many spiritual benefits of fasting, when you feel the hunger pangs, it will remind you to think about Yovah Elohim and the need to draw closer to Him by controlling and supplementing the carnal appetites. When, when we fast, even if it's a little bit, I purposely fast a meal here and there because I want to feel the hunger pains. I don't want to rule, I don't want my carnal appetites to rule me. I want to feel the hunger pains because that's a way to push the, the soul man down and let the spirit man rise up. That's what Day of Atonement is not, not all about, but a large part of it. I, I, I would encourage you to take this with you and, and, and put it in your Bible or someplace and go over these. And, and add some more to the list. And if you come up with some new ones, email them to me. Or if you have some here, there's many things that can be done. 22 is not a sacred number. That's just what I came up with. 
Any thoughts or comments? I want to make the word practical. I want to help us to walk out and be victorious and to stay in the river of life. That's what this is all about. And these are just a few of the things that I've come up with that I try to do in my life. I don't live up to this perfectly. I'm human and carnal just like everybody else, but I really try to. It helps me. And if I remind myself of these things from time to time, I'll be more likely to do them. You know what I mean? We need constant reminders and build these good habits into our lives. Amen. Everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, come and eat. Listen diligently to me, and eat what is...